After three months of work, I have finally finished breaking down every single frame of the Half-Blood Prince film. It was a lot of work, so please if you enjoy the video, like and comment to help with the algorithm so it will be pushed to more people, and please share it if you think the video is worthy of it. Links below, I put parts 1 to 5 of this easter egg series. Also, due to copyright, which I've been trying to fight for so long, I can't actually use clips in this video. So unfortunately, when characters are speaking in clips I play, it just has to be a still frame. I think it's because they're longer videos, so Warner Brothers thinks that I'm trying to upload like a huge section of the movie, which obviously I'm not. But nevertheless, it's not worth getting a copyright strike. I tried my best for you guys, and unfortunately it didn't work out, so I found a solution. With that being said, if you like this video, as I said, please give it a like because it will help with the algorithm. And if you like what you see, hit that subscribe button, and you can also follow me on all of my other social medias, all of which I've linked down below, and all of which have similar content that I make here on this channel. Now that I've said that, let's get the video started. The film starts with a very quiet line from the last movie uttered by Bellatrix. Then another line by Fudge, and of course Voldemort's scream when he blew up the atrium. The cuts on Harry's face were perfectly done when compared to the end of the last movie, with two cuts on the right cheek, a cut above his lip on the same side, and a bloody nose. The cameras the press are using are not powered by electricity, but rather magically, which gives it the ability to create moving pictures. You can see some reporters trying to ask questions, but Dumbledore pulls Harry away from this, which is very fitting, seeing how he always tries to protect Harry, even when keeping stuff from him hurts him, as we saw in the last film. This is the first title sequence to have the darker gray, as the first two were gold, the third and fourth were silver, and the fifth was blue. The building shown here is City Hall in London, and this woman right here is a character named Sophie, who was actually the only muggle in this scene who had a name. This muggle right here is drinking tea, which very much aligns with one thing England is known for. The dark mark appearing in the clouds is very contradicting to the books, because the only way this can be cast is by a witch or wizard who shoots a spell into the air from the ground, and normally it's made of its own green light, not the clouds, just as it was in the fourth movie. Also, the Death Eaters flying is contradicting to the books as well, because the only two people who can fly without a broom in the series are Voldemort and Snape. Looking at London here, the Ministry of Magic is actually directly below this, meaning that both the Muggle and Magical Government in England are stacked together. This specific square with the fountains is Trafalgar Square located in central London. You can see a bunch of England flags here, the classic telephone booths the city is famous for, some classic European taxi cabs, and an entrance to Leicester Square Station, which is part of the underground in the city. The route they take through the streets is very similar to the route the night bus took in the third movie, which makes sense considering they have the the same destination, the Leaky Cauldron. When they burst through the door of the pub, it appears to be a back entrance, and we get a quick look at the place, and though it's quick, it definitely captures the same aesthetic the pub had in the first and third films. We then enter the room where Hagrid took Harry in the first film, where the bricks open up to Diagon Alley. You can see the different shops like Madame Malkin's and Elop's Al Emporium on the left, quality Quidditch supplies on the right, and of course Gringotts straight ahead. They end up crashing into Ollivander's wand shop, which is where Harry got his wand in the first movie, and they kidnap Ollivander himself. They couldn't book John Hurt for this movie, the man that played him in the first film, which is why they covered his face, but luckily they were able to get him for the Deathly Hallows. In this shot, you obviously see Weasley's Wizard Wheezes, but there's also a sign for Wiseacre's wizarding equipment, a shop called Peter Boat that makes twine and rope, Flourish and Blots below that, where the bookshop scene took place in the second movie, and behind that, another shot of quality Quidditch supplies. To the left of Ollivander's is also Scribulous Writing Implements, another shop where Hogwarts students go to get school supplies. As the shot moves, you can see how Weasley's wizard wheezes lights up the body attached to the head, going blue and then orange. We get a look at Fenrir Greyback, who was actually the werewolf that bit Remus Lupin as a kid, which he did for revenge on Remus's father, who had spoken out against Greyback in a trial with the Ministry. Greyback isn't actually a Death Eater, by the way. He simply worked with them, mainly because Voldemort didn't think a werewolf was worthy of having his dark mark. The bridge that they take down in the movie is the Millennium Bridge, which differs from the novels because there it was the Brockdale Bridge. This is an interesting change because the Half-Blood Prince book actually takes place in 1996, while the Millennium Bridge wasn't built until the year 2000, which keeps my theory going in these Easter egg videos that the Harry Potter books and the Harry Potter movies are two separate universes with two separate timelines. The next scene takes place in Surbiton Station, a real-life location. Up here they have an ad that says Magic, which we see more of later saying Divine Magic, an obvious reference to the Wizarding World, but also an ad for Muggle 
perfume. The billboard also says that it was created by Lima Carnero, and this is a tribute to two graphic artists that worked on the Potter films, Eduardo Lima and Mauricio Carnero. There's also an ad that says shop till you drop, as well as an ad for London travel cards, one of which has Tower Bridge, a location Harry actually flew past in the last movie with the Order of the Phoenix. The train that goes by is either a class 444 or class 450, both of which were not created until 2003 and 2004, which again goes against the book timeline of 1996, again showing that the movies have their own timeline that's separate from the books. The Daily Prophet Harry is reading summarizes the first chapter of this book pretty well, going over the bridge collapsing, the new Minister of Magic, who was of course Rufus Scrimger, the person that took Fudge's job, and they also mention Harry being the Chosen One, a rumor that spread a lot that summer after the Battle of the Department of Mysteries. Down here where it says, you know who, if you read on, it says that he threatens to uncover the Wizarding World, basically meaning he'll expose them to the Muggles and rule over the Muggles. They also show an article about flu powder mishaps, as well as an article about the Chudley Cannons, which is actually Ron's favorite Quidditch team. Over here, they have a magical symbols game you can play, which also appeared in the Daily Prophet in the last movie. Up here, it looks like they misspelled freshly, adding an E before the Y, but that might just be a UK to American thing. I don't know, you guys spell the word color weirdly too, adding a U in there for some reason? So I don't know. They also have an aggressive amount of no smoking signs here. There are three of them just in this one shot, and we saw one on the table earlier too. The other side of the newspaper mentions getting VIW tickets for Spellbound. First off, VIW is absolutely hilarious, making it go from very important person to very important wizard. And Spellbound is a band that's been featured in newspapers in every movie since the third one, so I love that they kept that going. And the rest of this page is very similar to things I've gone over in previous videos in this series, so we're gonna move on to the next page. We see that Lucius is in Azkaban after leading the Death Eaters in the battle last movie, and honestly, I'm a bit disappointed they didn't use this picture which was cut from the last movie. That would have been perfect. In this picture though, Lucius is seen wearing a necklace with a snake twisted into a nod, a nod to his Hogwarts house Slytherin. We also see Draco and his mother Narcissa as they leave Lucius' trial, and this is the first time we've ever seen Narcissa in the films. They're swarmed by a very similar group of paparazzi that followed Harry and Dumbledore in the first shots of the film. And below that, they have an article about how Death Eaters challenge security measures for the Ministry. All of this is also under the Ministry of Magic Affairs section, meaning that tons of people read this article and now know the truth about the Malfoys. We see another no smoking sign over here, making that be five no smoking signs in this one shop. So I'm guessing that they don't want people to smoke in there, but that's just a hunch. This Muggle character was played by actress Erica Johnson, credited as just Waitress, and she was not a character that appeared in the books. On the menu here, you can see all different teas they have, which is very London-esque. The Muggle man right here is reading The Guardian, a real-life daily newspaper, which is cool because that very news outlet actually made an article about this movie back in 2009 when it came out, and I'm sure it's no coincidence that they chose to use a picture from this part of the film for the headline. The lights flickering before Dumbledore appears is something the movies often do when magic is approaching. We first saw this when the night bus was coming in the third film, then when the Dementors were coming in the fifth, and now here when Dumbledore arrives in the sixth film. The fogged up window was also something similar to the Dementors freezing the water on the window on the Hogwarts Express. Harry talking about how trains takes his mind off things. I like riding around on trains. It takes my mind off things is a very interesting line because if you think back, a train is of course what took him away from all of his troubles living with the Dursleys and took him to his real home of Hogwarts. Dumbledore's blackened hand shows how a horcrux can poison you, and we'll talk more about that later in the video. The sensation of apparating was pretty well shown in the movie as it was described as this in the book. Everything went black, he was pressed very hard from all directions, he could not breathe, there were iron bands tightening around his chest, his eyeballs were being forced back into his head, his eardrums were being pushed deeper into his skull, and then he gulped great lungfuls of cold night air and opened his streaming eyes. Welcome to the charming village of Budley Babbitton. The town of Budley Babbitton was shot in Lackick, Wiltshire, and that's not a real muggle village, but it's actually the combination of two real life muggle villages names, Budley Salterton and a suburb in Edinburgh called Babbitton. 
Rowling most likely combined the two to make her own fictional town. You can see a grandfather clock knocked over, which was a great detail taken right from the book for this scene. We also see an article about Harry being the chosen one, similar to the article we saw earlier, but this time it's paired with a moving picture of Harry, which was taken during that opening scene of the film. The magic that Slughorn used to become a chair was advanced transfiguration. The film having Dumbledore recognize dragon blood on his own is actually an incredible detail. What gave me away? Dragon's blood. This is because one of his calls to notoriety in the Wizarding World was discovering the 12 uses of dragon blood, which was a groundbreaking discovery. In the book, Dumbledore didn't identify it as dragon blood, he merely asked Slughorn what kind of blood it was, and Slughorn told him. I'm not sure if the filmmakers actually thought of that or if it was just a coincidence, but either way, it makes for a really cool detail. The Death Eater's trying to recruit Slughorn. The Death Eaters have been trying to recruit me for over a year. Do you know what that's like? Is an interesting detail because Voldemort, of course, owed Slughorn a lot for teaching him about Horcruxes. And taking that into account, Voldemort could have had his Death Eaters looking for him to have him either join his ranks or to kill him so that nobody knew his secret. Personally, I'd say the second option, killing Slughorn to keep him quiet. To put the room back together, Dumbledore used a mending charm, sometimes referred to as a repairing charm. And going deep into Harry Potter lore, the spell was invented by a witch named Aurabella Nutley in 1754, who at the time worked for the improper use of magic office at the Ministry of Magic. Looking at Slughorn's photos, you have Lily played by Gertiline Somerville, who over the course of 10 years played Lily for every scene she was in besides the young prince's tail scenes. Behind her, this is Dirk Cresswell, who was the head of the Goblin Liaison Office, and during the events of the Deathly Hallows, he would go on the run with Dean Thomas and Ted Tonks, the father of Nymphadora Tonks. He also points out Barnabas Cup, who was the editor-in-chief of the Daily Prophet. You recognize Barnabas Cup, editor of the Daily Prophet? And he's played by actor Roger C. Bailey. Down here in this picture with Slughorn is Ambrosius Flume, who went on to create the successful candy shop Honey Dukes, which is located in both Hogsmeade and Diagon Alley. Gwenog Jones is also pointed out. Gwenog Jones, captain of the Hollyhead Harpies. And the team Slughorn says she plays for, the Hollyhead Harpies, is a Quidditch team in the same league as the Chudley Cannons, Ron's favorite Quidditch team that I mentioned earlier in the video. The Hollyhead Harpies is also the team that Ginny would play for after Hogwarts when she played professional Quidditch. Interestingly, Gwenog is wearing the same glasses that Harry wore when playing in the rain during the Prisoner of Azkaban film. Throughout Slughorn's pictures, you can see all different accomplishments that his Slug Club students got, like a girl signing a contract to work for the Ministry of Magic, wizarding explorers signing and sending the photo of them conquering this land to Slughorn, a student winning a prize of some sort, which Slughorn no doubt helped her achieve with his many connections. You can also see pictures of various slug clubs throughout the years, each with different clothing styles based on the decade, including one with a young Lucius Malfoy. And of course, there's Regulus Black, Sirius Black's brother, aka R.A.B., the one who discovered Voldemort's secret before anyone else did. It appears that this is a picture of the Slytherin Quidditch team that year, with seven players all in Slytherin uniforms with their head of house, who at the time was Slughorn, and this means that Regulus played Quidditch. The magazine that Dumbledore was reading was called Knitter's Own, and it housed 27 scrumptious patterns and step-by-step -step crochet. You can also win 100 euros worth of that season's yarn, and it has a section that tells you how to knit simple cozy socks for the family. The detail the filmmakers put into these films is absolutely outstanding. The movie changes the rules of apparating because in the book, it's not possible to apparate someone without going with them, which is exactly what Dumbledore did here when he sent Harry to the burrow. Harry arrived there all by himself. They changed the burrow quite a bit from the second and fourth films. They removed the driveway leading up to it, as well as the small body of water right next to the driveway. They instead added very high grass and moved the body of water much farther away from the house and almost made it like a swamp. This change was most likely made so that they could have that chase scene during Christmas break. The house itself though is exactly the same for the most part, and as is the garage next to the house, which is Mr. Weasley's workshop. Harry looking up at Ginny's bedroom, which is clearly on the second or third floor, differs from the book, where her room is actually on the first floor. However, looking at the second movie, Ginny did come downstairs from her room, meaning this goes along with the film's continuity of the burrow's layout. The layout of downstairs is a bit different than the second movie. First off, the three-leaf window design changed its location, now being on the below window rather than being on the upper one. Where they used to have their kitchen is also now their living room. Looking up the stairs, you can see a framed picture of the 
word Weasley with symbols around it. Ron poking his head out from the top level is accurate to the book, as he is the only room on the fifth floor, the top floor of the home besides the attic. The kitchen of the burrow is very different, as it's much more modern and matches a lot better than it did in the second film. Behind Harry here is a sketch of the burrow, which they proudly hung up. Back here in the cupboard is a wizarding cereal called Pixie Puffs, which we've seen featured in the last three movies. Molly asking what they do without Dumbledore. Oh, that man. But then what would we do without him? Foreshadows his death later in the movie. The clock you see here is the famous Weasley clock, but it's also very different than what we saw in the second film. There they had the kids' pictures on the hands, but now they just spell out their names for each person in the family. I love how the other side of the hand has the letter the name starts with, and I also love to see Charlie on there, as he's forgotten about a lot in the movies. The design of the clock is also much different, no longer having who I said were either the Weasley twins painted there or Molly's brothers Fabian and Gideon. Now, instead, they just have random witches, but above is also a painting of Mrs. Weasley flying a broom over the burrow. The choices of places are also different from the second movie, and are actually much more accurate to the book because, as I pointed out in part 2 of this series, wizards do not go to the dentist. In Ron's room, you can again see that his room opens up to an open hallway that is not enclosed, just as we saw in the fourth movie. We also see Hermione's cat Crookshanks out there, who she got three years ago at this point. Behind Harry, you can see two owls, Hedwig and Pigwidgeon, Ron's owl who was gifted to him by Sirius at the end of the third book. You can see a Chudley Cannon's poster back here, as well as Chudley Cannon's stickers, which, as I mentioned before, is Ron's favorite Quidditch team. He also has what looks like a snake hung up on the wall, which seems out of character for a Gryffindor, but okay. And next to that is a poster that sort of looks like the eye from the Lord of the Rings, though I doubt that's what it depicts. There's also some artwork hung up that Ron most likely drew himself. Ron saying that Dumbledore is 150 is pretty inaccurate. 150? Give or take a few years. He was actually 115 when he died, so he was either 115 at the time or just about to turn 115 as his birthday was in late August. The paper that Harry is burning is a copy of the same Daily Prophet he was reading in the underground, which of course depicts Draco after his father's trial. He also most likely used the Incendio spell to catch it on fire, which actually breaks the underage magic rule because Harry is not 17 yet. However, he would not get caught here the way he did at the Dursleys, because the Ministry only knows knows where magic is being used, not who is using it, so obviously they would just think it was Mr. and Mrs. Weasley that cast the spell in the burrow. This town is called Cokeworth, which is where Snape grew up, and is also where Lily and Petunia grew up as well. On top of that, it's a town that Vernon Dursley went to when trying to evade the Hogwarts letters in the first book. The home where the sisters arrive is on Spinner's End, and this is the home in which Snape grew up, and is the home that he inherited when his parents died. He returned here every summer when the Hogwarts school year was not going on. Wormtail answering the door is a detail from the book, which told us that Voldemort assigned him there to assist Snape with whatever he needed. This is a very interesting dynamic, because they were enemies during their Hogwarts days, Wormtail of course being part of the Marauders friend group who despised Snape and who Snape despised right back. However, at the same time, Wormtail was responsible for the death of Snape's greatest enemy, James Potter. But adding to that, Wormtail was also the reason why the love of Snape's life, Lily Potter, died. So yeah, it's a pretty complicated dynamic between the two. Snape is reading the same article that Harry was reading in the underground, as it reports on the bridge collapse, the new minister, and Harry being the chosen one. Snape also references the article about Harry being the chosen one later in the movie. How grand it must be to be the chosen. You can see Wormtail's silver hand, which was gifted to him by Voldemort after he cut off his real hand to bring the Dark Lord back to life. Bellatrix's necklace is the same one she wore in the last movie. It has a bird skull, and as I pointed out in my last video of this series, this is symbolic to her and Voldemort's daughter Delphi, who also had a bird on her neck, though hers was not a necklace, but rather a tattoo. Snape slamming the door and locking it was him using the Caliportus charm, or the locking spell. Snape has a picture of a lake, which could be the lake where he and Lily went as kids before going to Hogwarts. Getting our first real look of Narcissa, her hair is really unique as it's both blonde and black, perhaps hinting at the good and evil in her as she does end up saving Harry in the end. For reference in the book, she had just blonde hair, which greatly differed from her sisters Bellatrix and also Andromeda, Nymphadora Tonks' mother, both of whom had all black hair. Also, her earrings are in the shape of spiders, which I thought was a cool detail. In this picture behind Bellatrix, it looks a lot like the bridge the three brothers made in the Tales of Beetle the Bard, and you can also see three figures on the bridge representing the Peveril brothers, as well as someone meeting them at the end, which might be death. 
The unbreakable vow is a magically bonding contract, which if you break, you die. Fascinatingly, the rings around them all come up at the same time in the film, but in the book, with each vow that Snape makes, it adds a ring for each, going one at a time. Narcissa is also wearing a ring which has a skull on it, and I've seen people say that this is the dark mark, but there's no snake coming out of its mouth, so I don't think that's what it is. Especially because Narcissa was not a Death Eater herself, she was just related to and married to a Death Eater, so I think it's just a normal random skull. I mentioned this earlier, but now that we have a closer look at it, the face on Weasley's Wizard Wheezes is one of the twins. The amount of work that went into the short scene is absolutely incredible, and I'm gonna make sure that the filmmakers get all the credit they deserve for it. They made up 300 names of products and made thousands of them to fill the set, all inspired by sweet shops and toy stores from the 1950s with bright colored tins and plastic. Right away, we see the bunny disappear from under the hat, which is a funny nod to muggle magic that inspired the twins' creations in a lot of ways, as they even had a muggle magic section in the store. We see some of their wildfire whiz bangs, which blew up the OWL exams in the last movie. These balls are bombastic bombs, which explode the twins' fireworks everywhere. There are what look like joke dragon eggs up here, and below that are shield hats, which you can see a sign for in the next shot. These were mentioned in the book, and actually worked so well that the Ministry of Magic bought a ton of them for their oars to wear while in combat. Posters for skiving snack boxes are hung underneath the stairs, Flying saucers fly past the twins, and a box of snakes then appears, which is being carried by Verity, the twins' first employee for the shop who was also in the novel. The twins' ties have a W on it that lights up, and they're also wearing the same suits that the statue outside is wearing. This shelf has a bottle that, according to the sign, causes snowstorms, and at the top of the shelf it says Weasley's. Here we see a boy eating puking pastels, one of the twins' original inventions, and you can also see fainting fancies as well. Also, this statue of a witch puking up puking pastels is one of the coolest elements of any Harry Potter set, and they barely even show it, which is wild. Back here are custard pies, which has a propeller in the middle of it that flings it everywhere. This girl gets shocked from the twins' electric shock shake product, and the guy that shocked her also has a bag from the shop, which the filmmakers made a ton of, as well as receipts to go with it, which is crazy because you will never see that in the movie. They have canned snakes, another product inspired by muggles, what looks like Weasley buttons you can buy, and at the top shelf are mega boxes, which house a whole array of their merchandise. On the stairs, it reads out, more magical mayhem, up, up, up. And across the top, it says shenanigans for all ages. There's also the Umbridge toy, which mocks the line she said in the last movie. As we keep going, they have a bunch of cooked eggs just floating, a box that just says Weasley stuff, a poster for dung bombs, a product called Rubio Chicken, which is a step dancing chicken according to the package, special joke quills that could possibly help you cheat in school, and down here are some of their fireworks, including Explosive Enterprises, their biggest fireworks. These right here are their You Know Poo products, which makes you constipated, and which also makes fun of Voldemort or You Know Who. Get it? You Know Who? You know poo. These you know poo products were mentioned in the book, and Mrs. Weasley was horrified when she saw it, scared that Voldemort would come after them for using him as a joke. Next to that is sticky trainers, which the boy is using here, and they allow you to walk on any surface. Instant darkness powder was a product mentioned in the book, and it's not actually invented by the twins, but rather by wizards in Peru, hence the sign saying Peru. To the left are pygmy puffs, which were creatures that Fred and George bred from a mini puff skin. The love potions were barely shown in the movie, but they had all different brands of the stuff with clever names. We also see their edible dark marks, and it's pretty ballsy to have them considering how many Death Eaters shut down shops in Diagon Alley with attacks. Right here is another moving statue that the filmmakers made, and it held their product Pimple Vanisher, and the statue actually grew pimples and then had them go away, which is incredible detail by the filmmakers. To the right of the twins is a section called Muggle Magic, which is the part of the shop that I mentioned earlier where they have things you could get from a Muggle Magic store. Below it, you can also see a row of sausages for some reason. These boys also have Fred Weasley's basic blaze box, which holds a ton of fireworks. The product Ron asks his brothers about is a screaming yo-yo, which he showed interest in in the book as well. You can also see a spider on a cactus, and I'm definitely interested to see what that's about. As they walk out, you can see Fever Fudge and Puking Pastels, both of which were in the skiving snack boxes that we saw in the last movie before they opened up their shop. 
Back here is the Weasley's employee Verity, and the register she's using was actually bought by the prop department on eBay. You can also see a few more of the Weasley's Wizard Weezes checkout bags with their logo on it. Also, here's a better look at the puking statue, and also a kid walking by with a charged bombastic bomb. Outside of the shop is a cart for dragon roasted nuts, and this is an awesome detail, because this is the mini Hungarian horntail that Harry pulled out of the bag right before the first task of the Triwizard Tournament in the fourth movie. He did keep the mini dragon in the book, as it was mentioned it was on his bedside table, but we never heard anything about it after that, so I guess in movie canon, Harry gifted it to Fred and George. This would add up because in the novel, Harry gave them all of his Triwizard winnings, which was how they had enough money to start their joke shop in the first place, so he might have given them the Hungarian horntail on top of that. In Diagon Alley, there are tons of windows boarded up, and on this one, it has multiple wanted posters for Bellatrix Lestrange as well as Amicus Caro, which hints at a Death Eater that was there the night Dumbledore died, and also who ended up taking over the school with his sister Electo in the Deathly Hallows. Here you can see some sketchy goblins posted outside the alley that leads to Nocturne Alley, the place where Harry ended up going in the second movie. Behind the trio is a used bookstore, which we've seen in previous films, and also in the novels as well. I also love the detail of the stacked cauldrons they have outside of the shop. We see a wanted poster for Greyback, the werewolf that kidnapped Ollivander at the beginning of the movie. We then return to the shop where Harry wound up in the second movie, Borgen and Burke. Borgen and Burke has a really cool history, because it's actually where Voldemort worked after graduating from Hogwarts, and that job put him in position to acquire Hufflepuff's cup, as well as Slytherin's locket, and he would of course go on to turn both of those into two of his seven horcruxes. At the front of the shop, you can see a giant hand, which could be a new version of the Hand of Glory, the hand that snatched Harry in the second film. It's obviously much bigger here, but it wouldn't be the first time we saw something big be changed like that. You can also see a skeleton inside the shop, which definitely fits in with what the shop is known for. You can see some more wanted posters for Bellatrix, and also Electo Caro, whose brother's wanted poster we saw moments before this. And speaking of the Caros, they are among the group walking into the shop, followed by Thorfinn Rao, and of course Greyback. Rao will actually be one of the Death Eaters that attacks the trio in the diner in the next movie. Speaking with Draco and his mother is Borgin, the shop owner who Draco had interacted with in the second book, as well as in a deleted scene in the second movie. They're of course looking at the Vanishing Cabinet, which Draco knew had a connection to Hogwarts because in the previous year, the Weasley twins pushed Slytherin student Graham Montague in it, and he could hear what was going on both in Hogwarts and in Borgin and Burks. In this shot of the Hogwarts Express, you can see a little hut right here, which is in the middle of absolutely nowhere. Also, this is my favorite shot of the Hogwarts Express in any of the films. This is always the one I use in my videos if I'm talking about the train. You can see that Ginny has a pygmy puff, one of the creatures that Fred and George sell at their shop. She's also talking to Dean Thomas, who she started dating at the end of last year. You can hear Luna passing out a magazine. This is actually her father's magazine, which I guess Luna is selling to students on the train. You can see it says, Free Spectre Specs, which Luna is currently wearing on the top of her head. Looking at the cover of the Quibbler, it actually tells us where the headquarters of the magazine is, saying it's on the second floor of a place in Hogsmeade, the town next to Hogwarts, which I think is super interesting. The front also says that the magazine is the Wizarding World's alternative voice, which adds up with how much rubbish the magazine puts out. One of the main articles teased is about pandemonium at the ministry, saying what a palaver, and it says it's written by X Lovegood, meaning Xenophilius Lovegood himself wrote this piece. It also says something about Raxpert, which unfuzz the mystery, which Ginny and Luna actually discuss here. What's a Raxpert? They're invisible creatures. They float in your ears and make your brain go fuzzy. At the bottom of the magazine, it mentions the corruption in the Quidditch League, which I personally would love to hear Xenophilius' take on. Down here, there's an article about runes written by Eduphora Murgis, which is another nod to the graphic artist that worked on the Potter films combining Eduardo Lima and Mirafora Mina. Luna has her classic radish earrings, which Ivana Lynch actually helped make, showing that she really is Luna. Luna mentions that pygmy puffs are known to sing on Boxing Day. They've been known to sing on Boxing Day, you know? Which is the day after Christmas on December 26th. You can see a chocolate frog scaling the window of this compartment, just as we saw Harry's first chocolate frog do in the first film. In that same compartment, the kids have a whole load of candy, which is also very reminiscent of Ron and Harry's first time on the train. These twin girls that Harry passes are Slytherin students Flora and Hestia Caro, who are obviously related to the Death Eater Caro siblings who I just discussed. Harry uses the Peruvian Instant Darkness Powder that he got from Fred and George's shop here, and this makes it impossible to see, this product even resisting light if one was to cast the Luma's charm. Also, I have to say, the way they filmed this whole train sequence constantly going outside the train then back in was really well done. 
And while we're talking about the train, seeing this next compartment is noteworthy because it's a completely different setup than the ones we'd seen the trio in throughout the rest of the movies as it has no sliding glass doors, it's all just open. You can see Crab and Goyle sitting over here, and this is actually the last film that would feature both of them as Jamie Wylett, who played Crab, was cut out of the last two movies after being arrested. Instead, they replaced him with Blaze, who was also in this scene. Blaze is an interesting character because he has a very crazy backstory, at least his mother does. His mother was a famously beautiful witch who had been widowed seven different times. Also, notice the number seven, a constant theme throughout the Harry Potter books and movies. But anyway, each husband's death occurred under suspicious circumstances, and each one left Blaze's mother with a ton of gold. Next to Blaze is Pansy Parkinson, played by Scarlett Byrne, and she's the fourth actress to play the character, and she would be the one to finish out the rest of the series his pansy. Draco mentioning throwing himself off the astronomy tower I think I'd pitch myself off the astronomy tower if I thought I'd continue for another two years is great foreshadowing for the movie's climax. Malfoy is wearing a Slytherin ring and later you can see a Slytherin tie clip, both of which he's worn in every movie since the third. You can see Hagrid accompanied by his dog Fang who are waiting to take the first years across the lake just as he did for Harry in the first movie. Also, this is Hogsmeade Station which is part of the town Hogsmeade, the town next to Hogwarts Castle, and it's one of the oldest oldest known wizarding towns in the world. All of the shades that close have the Hogwarts logo on the bottom of them, which I thought was a cool detail. The sign above this door says the toilets are through here, and there's also a sign that says slides open and please close this door, which are just such specific details that don't need to be there, but the fact that they are there shows how dedicated they are to making this fictional world as real as possible. The spell that Draco uses is the full body bind curse, which Hermione actually used on Neville in the first film. Malfoy saying that kick was for his father That's for my father. was because Draco blamed Harry for his father's arrest after the Battle of the Astronomy Tower in the climax of the last film. Luna seeing rack spurts around Harry's head is the same thing she and Ginny talked about earlier in the train sequence. The spell Luna uses is Finite, the general counter spell which is used to terminate the effects of other spells, jinxes, or hexes. Luna is wearing a beetle ring, which was another part of the wardrobe for Luna that actress Ivana Lynch helped come up with and make. The entrance of Hogwarts Castle has two winged boars, and set designer Stuart Craig based these off a boar statue that's part of a fountain called Porcelliano, but he just added wings to them. Flitwick points out Aurors. Who are those people? Aurors. I mentioned Aurors earlier, but I'll go into more detail. Aurors are dark wizard catchers who are basically the police for the wizarding world, and they arrived at Hogwarts for Harry's sixth year as Dumbledore wanted extra security. Nymphadora Tonks was one of these Aurors in the book, but the movie cut her out of the scene. The cane that Filch asked Draco about is Draco's father's, which we saw him use a lot in previous films. Now that he's in Azkaban though, Draco decided to take it, which I always thought was weird considering his father's wand is inside of that cane. The snake on the end is actually the end of his wand. You can also see Mrs. Norris hidden in the shadows here. Also, I think it's hilarious that Filch has basically a metal detector complete with the headphones and everything, which I guess searches for dark magic. The spell Luna uses to fix Harry's nose is the healing charm that fixed minor injuries. The book that Hermione's reading is 1000 Magical Herbs and Fungi, and there's an interesting tidbit about this book. In the first book, Harry goes to buy the book 1000 Magical Herbs and Fungi, but later on when Harry looks up Dittany, it's in a textbook called 100 Magical Herbs and Fungi, not 1000. This has since been corrected in new editions, but I thought it was a funny mistake that I would point out. I love Neville's reaction to Hermione hitting Ron with her book. Matthew Lewis did a great job acting here. You can also see Lavender Brown way in the back watching this go down, and I'm sure it made her happy seeing that Hermione was being a complete psycho toward Ron. As we pan to Harry and Luna walking in, you can see someone carrying the sorting hat out of the Great Hall, meaning we just missed that year's sorting ceremony. I love the way Dumbledore's owl lectern has the bird spread its wings when he comes up to speak. That is something it has never done before. When they show the tables, this kid has me cracking up the way he's just looking up at the ceiling. Which to be fair is an incredible sight to see with the enchanted ceiling that sees outside. Back behind the teachers, you can see the four hourglasses that count each house's points throughout the year. At the staff table, you can see Professor Sprout, Slughorn, Snape, Hagrid, Charity Burbage, who was the person Voldemort killed at the beginning of the next film, then McGonagall, Flitwick, Madame Pomfrey, and two unknown professors. There were no other male professors who were teaching at this time besides Professor Binns, but he's a ghost. I guess this one could be Professor Binns, like he has the right appearance, it's just he doesn't really look like a ghost to me. 
We get a beautiful shot of three more oars who are brought in to protect the school. While Dumbledore mentions that the Death Eater's greatest weapon is you. Dark forces attempt to penetrate this castle's walls, but in the end, their greatest weapon is you. It's no coincidence that it cuts to Draco, who the Death Eaters of course use as their weapon to break into the castle later on in the movie. You can again see the Slytherin Caro twins in this crowd of people, who as I said are related to the Caro Death Eaters. McGonagall mentions a student named Davis. Mr. Davis! Mr. Davis, that is the girl's lavatory. This is Tracy Davis, a Slytherin student in the same year as Harry, and they were a character part of the original 40, the first 40 Hogwarts students that Rowling made before writing the series, which I actually made a video on if you're interested, I linked it below. But going back to Tracy Davis, this character was one of the original 40 that never got mentioned in the novels, so the filmmakers adding that character into the films is a really cool detail. McGonagall mentioning Harry's ambition to become an Auror, or is it no longer your ambition to become an Auror, refers to a conference they had during the events of the Order of the Phoenix, where Harry voiced his desire to take on this field after graduating Hogwarts. To become an Auror, you must have a minimum of 5 NEWTs, the test that 7th year students take, and you need it in Defense Against the Dark Arts, Transfiguration, Charms, Herbology, and Potions, which is why McGonagall asked why Harry isn't taking potions. I would think you would want to fill it with potions. But I was told I had to get an outstanding in my OWL. OWLs are the test fifth years take, and outstanding is the best grade you can get on the test, which Snape required for his sixth year potion students. Harry got in Exceeds Expectations, the second highest grade you can get, which fortunately for him, Slughorn, the new potions professor, does accept. This shot of Harry and Ron walking through the corridors always reminds me of that shot of the two of them heading to their first class together in the first film, and it really shows how far they've come. Seeing Lavender's reaction to Ron, then Hermione's reaction to Lavender's reaction was really well done here. The potions classroom has Latin written all around the arches, many of which are different chemical combinations, which of course goes hand in hand with the ingredients used for potion making. Scanning the class, you can see Seamus Finnegan, the Patil twins, which is always interesting in the movie, seeing as they made Padma a Gryffindor while in the book she was a Ravenclaw. You can also see Dean Thomas, Hermione, Neville, Lavender Brown, the Gryffindor Quidditch team's chaser Katie Bell played by a new actress named Georgina Leonidas, who was the third person to play the character. You can also see Leanne, who was with Katie when the necklace got her, then Ramilda Vane, the girl who likes Harry, which is also interesting because technically Ramilda was not old enough to be in that class. And of course the Slytherin crew, Draco, Crab, Goyle, Pansy, and Blaze. The advanced potion making textbook was written by Labacious Barrage, one of the world's most famous potioneers. He actually attended the Brazilian School of Magic Castela Bruxu, which is located in the Amazon rainforest. The love potion that Hermione is talking about is M. Hortentia, the most powerful love potion in the world, and as we learned in the last book, it's stored in the Department of Mysteries, or more specifically, in the love room of that department. Hermione's saying that she smells spearmint toothpaste when next to the love potion. For example, I smell spearmint toothpaste is actually a really great detail because the love potion smells like whatever attracts that person. And earlier in the movie, Ron told Hermione that she had toothpaste on her face and wiped it off her face, showing that she's attracted to Ron. It's a curious little potion known as Felix Felicis. Felix Felicis, or Liquid Luck, was invented in the 16th century by a wizard named Zygmunt Budge, and he has a fascinating history. He was an incredible potioneer, but was a bit crazy and unstable. He went to Hogwarts sometime in the 1500s, but dropped out at the age of 14 when the headmaster would not let him compete in a potions competition claiming that he was too young. Zygmunt instead moved to a remote island where he lived in solitude, and while there, he wrote a textbook called The Book of Potions, and following his death, some of his personality still lingered in the textbooks he wrote, acting as a guide for readers. Only once did a student manage to brew a potion of sufficient quality to claim this prize. The one student that Slughorn mentions was of course Severus Snape, aka the Half-Blood Prince. The Half-Blood Prince was named as such because Snape was Half-Blood and his mother Eileen's maiden name was Prince, so he combined the two to give himself that nickname, the Half-Blood Prince. The explanation for the Drought of Living Death says that it's one of the most powerful sleeping potions and that it's used to induce sleep so deep it's almost impossible to tell if a person is alive, meaning you could use it to fake your own death. The ingredients you need to make it include asphodel, wormwood, sloth brain, valerian roots, and sopophorus beans. I love the details of the students working, like Hermione's hair getting more and more frizzy as time goes on, Crab's tools melting, the Patil twins having flubber spill out of their cauldron, and 
and of course Seamus blowing stuff up, a running gag that's been going on in the film since the very first movie. We of course see the diary that Harry stabbed with the Basilisk Fang in the second movie, and this was one of Voldemort's Horcruxes. This Horcrux was interesting though, because it was made not to keep him alive, but rather to be used as a weapon to reopen the Chamber of Secrets, which is exactly what that part of the soul in the diary did years later. On Dumbledore's desktop, you can see the number 524, and I scoured to find if this had any meaning. And the best I could find was that May 24th, or 524, is Slughorn's actor's birthday. But I doubt that's what it is. I think it's just a random number that has no meaning. As more of the desk is revealed, there's a face, which I believe is the first ever headmaster of the school, because they have very similar features judging from the statue. And just to get this out of the way before people say I'm wrong in the comments, none of the four founders of Hogwarts ever held the role of headmaster, so none of them were the first ever headmaster. It was this guy. This view of the office is part of the back room behind the desk, and this is where Dumbledore actually sleeps and lives, and it's also where he and Harry had that talk about the prophecy at the end of the last movie. To the left, you can see Fox the Phoenix perched on the arm of the chair that Dumbledore sat in during their talk last film. Dumbledore putting the ring in the diary was an interesting choice because it pairs two different horcruxes. All of Dumbledore's memories house a lot of easter eggs. The front row all has some form of Tom Marvolo Riddle written on it, as well as dates. There's one from 1938, which is the one that Dumbledore picks up, meaning that's the orphanage memory. Tom was born December 31st, 1926, meaning that would make him around 11 years old going into the 1938 school year. This adds up perfectly because that's the age that you are when you start at Hogwarts. What's weird though is there's another memory for T.M. Riddle from 1937, a year before Dumbledore went to meet Tom. So maybe in movie canon, Dumbledore scouted the boy out before his initial visit to the orphanage and that's what this memory is. There's also one memory from 1968, which could be the memory of Hokey the House Elf, as she witnessed Tom visiting her master Hepzibah Smith, which then led to him stealing Hufflepuff's cup as well as Slytherin's locket, which I mentioned earlier when talking about him working at Borgen and Burke's. Meanwhile, we have this memory from 1971, which is most likely the memory when Voldemort came to Dumbledore to ask for the Defense Against the Dark Arts job. This was 10 years before his downfall in 1981, and if I'm correct about what this memory is, that would have been the night Voldemort put the curse on the Defense Against the Dark Arts job, dooming anyone who took on that position after he couldn't have it. In the other rows, there are some that might just be Dumbledore's normal memories that he saved. There's one memory that says M-O-M, which most likely stands for Ministry of Magic, meaning this memory probably took place in the Ministry. Over here, a memory has a triangle on it, which is of course part of the Deathly Hallows logo, the triangle being the Invisibility Cloak, meaning this could possibly be a memory to do with Harry's cloak. This immediately makes me think about how Harry's father James lent the cloak to Dumbledore before he died, meaning this could be the memory of either James giving him the cloak, or Dumbledore studying the cloak to see if it really was one of the Deathly Hallows. Next to that is a memory from 1923, which is three years before Voldemort was born. This means it might be the memory of Bob Ogden, who of course witnessed the first memory Dumbledore showed Harry in the book, introducing us to Voldemort's mother Merope, his uncle Morphin, and his grandfather Marvolo, and Tom Riddle Sr., Voldemort's father, also made a cameo. This giant case of vials could also house some other memories that we know Dumbledore collected over the years. This includes Karkaroff's trial, Ludo Bagman's trial, and Barty Crouch Jr., Bellatrix, Rodolphus, and Rebastian Lestrange's trial for torturing the Longbottoms. It could also house Burke's memory, the owner of Borgen and Burke's. In this memory that Dumbledore showed Harry, it depicted Voldemort's mother selling Burke's Slytherin's locket. Morphin's memory could also be in there as he met a teenage Tom Riddle, and going by movie canon, Dumbledore probably has the memory of reading Harry's name for the Triwizard Tournament in there, as we saw him looking at this memory in the pensive in the Goblet of Fire film. All of the memories that I guess you could call flashbacks have this green lighting slash overlay on it, and this could mean a few things. The most obvious is that it represents the colors of Slytherin, Voldemort's ancestor and the house that he was a part of. Or, it could reference the green cover that this book has, which just so happens to feature Harry and Dumbledore looking at, you guessed it, the memories. 
The car that appears here is a Humber 12 Vogue from the year 1935, which adds up to the timeline as we are currently in 1938. This car with the DLO 325 license plate has also been featured in a number of other shows and films, including Captain America The First Avenger. The sign for the orphanage coming apart details the state of the place, which wasn't the best. It's definitely exaggerated in the movie though, especially with the wall around it, the barbed wire fence, and the gates to enter. None of that was in the book, it was just a set of stairs that led to the door. Also, the name given to the orphanage, Wools, was not in the book. That was something that the filmmakers came up with. The actual building they used for this scene was made on the set at Leaveston Studios, but it was based on a real building that they scouted in Docklands, Liverpool. The woman talking to Dumbledore is actually Mrs. Cole, the matron of the orphanage, and from the book, we know that this job made her drink quite a lot, and also she might have been an alcoholic. Personally, I can relate, and I'll use this as a shameless promotion of my second channel where I talk all about that if you're interested. It's linked down below. You can see a back room behind Dumbledore and Mrs. Cole, and there was actually a whole set designed for this, as well as people cast to be in there, which is crazy considering we hardly even see it. There have been incidents with the other children. Nasty things. These incidents that Mrs. Cole was referring to include Tom leading two kids into a cave, and when they came out, they were never the same. And another notable one is a boy's bunny being hung after Tom had an argument with the bunny's owner. The actor that plays the young Tom Riddle here is named Hero Finds Tiffin, and he's actually the nephew of Ray Fiennes who plays Voldemort, which I think is really awesome. I've seen many people say that this could be Tom's diary that would later be his horcrux, but to me, it just doesn't look like the same book. The drawings inside of it though, and the chaotic scribbles, are classic psychopathic tendencies of kids who aren't right in the mind, which perfectly aligns with Tom Riddle. He is not right in the mind at all. In the next shot, we see seven rocks on this windowsill, which is great foreshadowing for how many times Tom wanted to split his soul. Seven. Seven. Then we get to a picture of the cave, which is of course the cave where Harry and Dumbledore go to find the locket later in the film, and it's also the cave where Tom took those two kids from the orphanage whose minds weren't right after. Tom is mentioned of making things move without touching them. I can make things move without touching them. It's very similar to Harry making weird things happen before he went to Hogwarts, like the glass vanishing at the zoo. Tom's room number is 27, which highlights the significance of the number 7 once again. The significance of the items that Tom stole are meant to foreshadow his desire to collect trophies after doing something wrong, whether that be bullying kids at the orphanage, or later in life, murdering someone and turning that trophy he collects into a horcrux. I can speak to snakes too. They find me. Whisper things. Voldemort being able to speak to snakes of course relates back to him being the heir of Slytherin, as Slytherin was the most famous parcel mouth in history. As we leave the memory, the smoke starts out with the young Tom Riddle's face, then it morphs to the older Tom Riddle, and finally it morphs to the present day Voldemort's face, which is a small but incredible detail. The Death Eaters coming in and running into the shield around Hogwarts shows all of the new precautions and safety spells that were put around the castle for this year. On the birdcage, it says, Do Dios Indi, which when translated says, Of the Independent God. Not sure what that means, but I thought I'd point it out. If you do know, let me know in the comments below, because personally, I'd love to know myself. Looking at the two bird cages that Draco could choose from, one bird is white and one bird is black, which symbolize good and evil. Later on, Draco of course chooses the white bird, which was the filmmakers hinting to us that deep down, there is still some good in him. The tapestry hung outside the room actually depicts a real life tapestry that was made in the late 1400s or early 1500s, and it depicts a group of noblemen hunters hunting a unicorn. Stuart Craig, the set designer for the Potter films, decided to incorporate this famous tapestry into his Hogwarts set. Interestingly though, this tapestry was not there when we saw the Room of Requirement in the last film. Also, I'm sure you already know this, but this room is the same one the DA used in the Order of the Phoenix. In the Room of Requirement, looking at some of the stuff, you can see butterflies and glass, old Quidditch trophies, some astronomy equipment, a record player that could be the one that Lupin used in the third film, an old school projector which could be the one that Snape used in the third film, a harp, some pots, a dream catcher, a tuba, a bunch of books, and even something that looks a bit like a Deathly Hallows logo and is similar to something that was in Dumbledore's office in the fourth film. Also, all of the stuff in this room, a room called the Room of Hidden Things, was full of things that students and teachers hid dating all the way back to 990 AD. Draco having a green apple aligns with his Hogwarts house Slytherin and is one of the funniest shippings in the Harry Potter fandom. Draco Malfoy and the apple. In this shot, it's interesting to see the Quidditch pitch without the tents around it. 
Harry has the number 7 on his Quidditch jersey, which continues the theme of number 7 always popping up throughout the series. This was also something that the films came up with. He did not have a jersey number in the books. I do wish that Harry was the only one that had this number though, because some other people have the number 7 on their jersey as well. It fascinates me to see the progression of Quidditch robes over the course of the films, because Wood never had any of these pads when he played Keeper, and honestly, I think I prefer the Half-Blood Prince version, it looks a lot cooler. Ginny being incredible at Chaser is noteworthy, because as I said earlier in the video, later in life, she would play professional Quidditch for the Hollyhead Harpies. This beater right here is Jimmy Peaks, and this chaser is Demelza Robbins, both of whom would make the team. When looking at the stands, you can again see the Slytherin twin girls Flora and Hestia Caro, who was of course related to the Caro Death Eater siblings. Hermione using the Confundus charm on Cormac is weird, because it pushes him to the side, but that's not at all what this spell is supposed to do. It doesn't affect you physically, but rather mentally, making you confused and misdirected. You can see that Harry is wearing Converse shoes, which is a funny detail, because Daniel Radcliffe convinced the costume designers to make these be the only shoes he wears from the fifth movie on. Hedwig can also be spotted in the background here. Not sure why she's not in the gallery, but it does make for a good background, I guess. On the Gryffindor notice board, you can see a sign for the Slugs and Bugs Club, which was there for the fifth movie as well. The newspaper that Hermione is reading says, More Disappearances at the Ministry, and it has a picture of all the missing employees, which matches up with the book where disappearances were happening left and right. The paper also had an article about dark wizards going unchecked, and one about where wizards would get their wands, which of course refers back to Ollivander, the number one wand maker being kidnapped at the beginning of the movie. In the background here, you can see Hermione's cat Crookshanks again. On the table, you can see a picture of some wanted wizards, which includes Bellatrix Lestrange and I believe Fenrir Greyback. The page that Harry has opened up says, Note, this is an extremely dangerous potion. This potion isn't supposed to be used for transforming humans into animals. This makes me think that this is the Polyjuice Potion recipe, because we did find out what would happen if a human transformed into an animal in the second movie. It also has some ingredients that's in Polyjuice Potion, like Fluxweed, one of the most important ingredients according to Rowling, and you can also see two humans standing next to each other on this page, each having an arrow pointing to the other, showing how one human becomes the other. Some other notable things to point out include it mentioning a bicorn horn, a type of magical creature, and also squids, and on top of that, the number 7 pops up several times in this recipe. As the pages go, we also see the Sectum Semper spell, which Snape noted was for enemies, and this was a spell that he actually created himself. On this page, it discusses alchemists turning different metals into gold or silver, it mentions spagyric, which refers to alchemists using plants rather than metals, and it mentions panacea, which was something that all alchemists strive to make because it cured all diseases and would prolong life. And at the bottom, it mentions the Philosopher's Stone, the stone that ties back to Nicholas Flamel and of course the first book. Emergency. Choir practice, I'm afraid, Horace. Flitwick saying that he has choir practice is something that the films made up for their own canon. He didn't do anything with the choir in the books, and the films actually made that be the main subject that he teaches. In the book, he teaches charms though, which technically he did teach in the first movie, but we never saw him teach it after that. They changed the three broomsticks quite a bit from the third movie, the last time we saw this pub, most notably with the placement of the stairs and with the things hung on the wall. The three broomsticks has a fascinating history. It opened in the year 1452, around the same time the town of Hogsmeade was created, and it's said that Hengist of Woodcroft, the man that created the village, called this pub his home. The man next to Slughorn is holding what I think is a ferret for some reason. As I've been making these videos, ferrets for some reason always pop up in the background. The filmmakers really love those creatures. There's a sign on the wall that says, All Natural Butter Beer, Pure and Healthy, which is a cool little detail that the set designers threw in there that I thought I'd point out. The person behind the bar is interestingly a man, which differs from the book, as Madame Rose Murda was the bartender in the novels, and she was also in the third film, so I'm not sure why they didn't have her come back. Ron telling Hermione that she has something on her face is a good callback to when he got toothpaste off her face earlier in the movie. That sort of becomes their thing. The necklace that Katie Bell touches was a dark opal necklace, which had actually been known to take the life of 19 different muggles. Harry had also seen this necklace when he went to Borgen and Burks in the second novel, though the movie did not have this detail. 
In McGonagall's classroom, there's a lemur behind her in a cage, which she had in her classroom in the second film as well. Looking at the Marauders map, this was of course created by the friend group known as the Marauders, which included Harry's father James, along with Sirius, Lupin, and Peter Pettigrew. I love the detail of the Whomping Willow being made out of text that spells out its name in both English, Latin, and a few other languages as well. At the end of this scene, you can see Wormtail and Prongs written out, which were the nicknames for Peter Pettigrew and James Potter and the friend group. We also see Malfoy disappear from the map because he went into the Room of Requirement, and the reason why the map can't show people in there is because the Marauders never knew about the secret room, so they didn't incorporate it into the map. Slughorn's mention of the Wolfsbane Potion For those of you who don't know, Marcus's uncle invented the Wolfsbane Potion was created by Democles Belby, Marcus Belby's uncle, and it was a potion that helped werewolves maintain their human mind when transforming at the full moon. We of course know that Remus Lupin used this potion all year during the Prisoner of Azkaban when he was teaching at Hogwarts. At the Slug Club table, we have Harry, Hermione, Neville, the Caro Twins, Cormac McLaggen, Blaze Zabini, Marcus Belby, a random kid we never get a good look at, and later Ginny Weasley. The hourglass that Slughorn has was not in the book, but the serpents that come off the bottom and top of course represent Slytherin House, which Slughorn was formerly the head of before retiring, and it was then taken over by Snape. We get another look at Slughorn's shelf of pictures with all of his students, now moved from the house where we saw them earlier. It's really interesting to see all of the Slytherins, including Crab and Goyle, getting riled up and having fun, while Draco just sits alone farther down the table, showing how distant he's become from even his best friends. You can see the Wizarding cereal Pixie Puffs on the Slytherin table, the same cereal that we saw at the Weasleys. Now in these videos, I look at these movies very, very closely. And while doing so, I noticed a small little mistake that I thought I'd point out. In this shot, Hermione is holding the paper up off the table, but in the next shot, it's flat on the table. Then it changes back to being held up in the next shot. Next to the trio, you can see Demelza Robbins as well as Dean Thomas, both of whom are on the Gryffindor Quidditch team captained by Harry. Luna's lion hat is something taken straight from the book, but in the novel, it growled. The film did have the lion blink though, which is a cool detail. Blaze Zabini is seen here, as he was a chaser for the Slytherin team during that school year. Among these Slytherin players, there's also Yurkord, who was the captain, Vasey, and Harper, who was substituted for Malfoy at Seeker. And among them is supposed to be Crab and Goyle, at least if you're going by book canon, but they obviously got replaced by random characters the movie made up. In the crowd, it's nice to see Lavender and Pravati next to each other, as they were best friends in the book, which the movies didn't really show that much. You can also see Cho Chang in the crowd, and she's even wearing all of her Ravenclaw colors. It's also funny to point out how butthurt Cormac McLaggen is after seeing how well Ron played. Next to him is also Nigel, a character made just for the movies, and who sort of morphed together Colin and Dennis Creevy. This shot of the Gryffindor team shows Ginny Weasley, Demelza Robbins, Jimmy Peaks, Richie Coote, and Dean Thomas leading the way. It's fun to look at the signs in the crowd, and funnily enough, I think the Slytherin students were holding their sign backwards, or just made it backwards. A number of people in the crowd also have tambourines, and Neville even has a Gryffindor drum, which is actually pretty awesome. You can see Butterbeer in the common room, which makes me wonder if Harry or someone else went through the secret tunnels that the Marauders map showed and got some from the three broomsticks, because that was the only way they had Butterbeer in the common room in the books. The birds flying around Hermione was something taken from the book, as they had been learning the spell Avis or the bird conjuring charm at this point in the school year. Then Hermione uses the Apugno Jinx to send the birds after Ron, which is a spell that basically aimed anything you wanted at a target. In this case, the target is Ron. Getting a shot of Draco on the astronomy tower is great foreshadowing for what's to come later in the movie. Seeing the behind the scenes of how they make the books magically put themselves on the shelf is kind of hilarious. The spell Draco uses was a spell made for the movie, and translating it, it means harmony, connect, and open, which all makes sense as he uses it to heal the cabinet, connect the cabinet to the one in Borgen and Burks, and open it to see if it works. The uniform that Slughorn had Neville and the other help wear has serpents that wrap around a pole, which creates two letters, H and S, for Horace Slughorn. The photographer is named Adrian, who was a former Slug Club member when he was at Hogwarts, and he was a character created just for the movie. We also have Eldred Werpel, another former member of the Slug Club, Camellia, a Hogwarts professor made up for the movies and who actually appeared in both the fourth and fifth film, and we also have Sanguini, who was actually a vampire and who was actually a character that was in the book. He was not made up for the movie. You can see the twins showing off one of their joke shop products, and next to them is Ron's owl, Pigwidgeon. 
The twins are also wearing really nice and expensive outfits, which shows how successful the shop is. The record player slash radio in the background is also a good detail, because in the book, Mrs. Weasley made everyone listen to her favorite singer that night on that radio. The garage where Harry and Arthur go is Mr. Weasley's shop where he has all of his muggle gadgets, and is also where he enchanted the flying car in the second movie. All of the random muggle items in here are props taken from the old films, including a TV and radio from North by Northwest, a classic Alfred Hitchcock movie. Other items include fans, propellers, printers, computers, boomboxes, a blender, a bunch of typewriters, a pinball machine, telephones, a blow dryer, too many muggle wires and plugs to count, and a motorbike, which could possibly be Sirius's old motorbike, which Sirius lent to Hagrid to bring Harry to the Dursleys at the beginning of the first movie. We do know that Arthur added modifications to this bike before the Deathly Hallows, so it would add up that this is the same bike and it's in the same garage where he also enchanted the car. We hear Tonks mention the cycle. First night of the cycle which refers to the cycle of the moon that dictates when Remus will turn into a werewolf. There's a picture of what looks like a drawing of a blue car that's flying, which could be one of the kids' drawings of the Ford Angula from the second film. As Bellatrix is taunting Harry, she says the same thing she said to him as he chased her in the last film. And honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if they just needed audio here and added one of the takes they filmed from the Order of the Phoenix, especially because we never see her actually saying these words. The paper that Hermione is reading is a story about Amelia Bones being murdered, who we actually saw during Harry's trial in the last film. In the book, we were told that Voldemort himself murdered her. The necklace that Lavender puts on Ron is straight from the book, and it says, My Sweetheart. Behind Harry, you can see a boy practicing the bird conjuring charm, the same thing that Hermione was doing earlier. Looking at the memories again, we have one that I believe says Sprout, meaning this could be a memory to deal with Pomona Sprout, the herbology professor. The boys at the table with Tom all look at him very admiringly, and this is exactly how it was described in the book. They would all become the first generation of Voldemort's Death Eaters, and to connect to two more recent Death Eaters, as one is part of the Avery family, and one is part of the Lestrange family. Interestingly though, they were not originally called Death Eaters, but rather the Knights of Walpurgis, which is one of those deep Harry Potter lore facts that I love to tell. Tom Riddle is played by Frank Delane in this scene, which is a change from Christian Coulson who played Tom Riddle at this age in the second movie. Slughorn mentions Professor Dippet. Up you go, boys, or Professor Tippett will have us all in detention. Who was the headmaster in charge of Hogwarts before Dumbledore took over. We of course see the same hourglass that Slughorn had in his office in present day, and just like Harry, Tom is fascinated by it. You can see that Slughorn has his photos of his favorite students set up, and it's a great deal smaller than it was in present day, which makes sense as he hasn't seen as many students. Just a really nice detail from the set designers that I wanted to give credit to. Slughorn's mention of light and dark. There be no light without the dark is very reminiscent of Sirius's line in the last film. We've all got both light and dark inside of us. On Ron's bedside table, you can see a Chudley Cannons flag as well as stickers for the team, which as I said earlier, is Ron's favorite Quidditch team. The love potion that Romilda Vane used was actually from Weasley's Wizard Wheezes, so Ron's own brothers were responsible for him falling in love with Romilda. In Slughorn's drawers, you can see that same logo that he had the staff at the Christmas party wear, which spells out HS for Horace Slughorn. They did not explain this in the film, but Harry knew to use a Bezoar as the antidote because the Half-Blood Prince book told him about this earlier. We see the matron Madame Pomfrey played by Gemma Jones, who hadn't played the role in seven years, her last appearance being in the second film. They have a desk outside the hospital wing, which is something new and something that was never mentioned in the books or seen in any of the films, especially in the third film where we saw them literally go out this door several times and there was no desk. The paper that Hermione's reading has a warning about the Death Eater Fenrir Greyback, which is odd because as I mentioned earlier in the video, Greyback isn't actually a Death Eater, he just worked with them. We see Harry look at the Sectum Semper spell that Snape wrote down, but it's actually in a different part of the page than it was last time we saw it. We get a vertigo effect here with Draco, which the film student in me just couldn't leave out. It's a technique that appears to zoom both in and out at the same time, and it was made famous by Alfred Hitchcock in his film Vertigo, hence where we get the name Vertigo Shot. 
The statue right here in the Great Hall depicts the architect of Hogwarts when it was built. This is just film lore though, and it actually contradicts book lore, as in the book, Rowena Ravenclaw was the one who designed the layout of the castle. When it cuts to the bird cages, we can now see that while at first Draco only took the white bird, hinting at the good in him, both the white and black birds are now missing, meaning Draco also gave into the darkness inside of him. The reason the Sectum Semper spell is so deadly is because it's basically taking a sword and slashing someone in whatever movement your wand makes. The spell that Snape uses to heal Malfoy is a healing spell. And this spell was actually used in the most recent Wizarding World installment, The Secrets of Dumbledore, where Grindelwald used it on the Chillin'. We get another look at the tapestry depicting the trapped unicorn, which was outside the Room of Requirement. The bird coming out of the cabinet of course tells us that Draco successfully mended it, before Draco himself even knew that. This is the first time we've seen the greenhouses at Hogwarts since the second film during the Mandrake scene. Also, the plant that Slughorn is getting is Venomous Tentacula, a plant that actually killed Minerva McGonagall's husband, Elphinstone Yercourt. This happened about six years before the first book took place, and it's just one small part of McGonagall's very tragic backstory. Aragog is the same Acromantula we saw in the Chamber of Secrets, and he was actually 55 years old when he died. Hagrid had him as a pet when he was a student at Hogwarts before being expelled. In this shot of Hogwarts, you can see the Great Hall, which is lit by the floating candles. The dog playing Fang in this movie was named Luigi, and he was a standout because in the other movies, it took four different dogs just to make sure that they got the shots they needed, but Luigi did it all by himself. The bottle that Hagrid and Slughorn are drinking is called Berry Aki Rod, which according to the label was a fruit wine that contained 17% alcohol, that the berries used for it were picked and pressed by house elves, and that it was aged in oak and bung barrels for a thousand years. No bigger than a Pekingese. A Pekingese, mind you. What Hagrid mentioned here is a type of dog, which is normally really small. You can see Hagrid's pink umbrella in the background, which houses a part of his wand that got snapped after his expulsion from Hogwarts, and which we also saw him use in the first movie. Harry speaking of his mother being the reason why he got a scar. Do you know why I survived, Professor? The night I got this? Because of her. Because she sacrificed herself plays back to how her sacrifice triggered a magical love protection, which basically put a shield around Harry, thus making Voldemort's killing curse bounce back and hit him instead, only giving Harry a scar and nothing else. A Horcrux. Horcruxes were actually created by a man named Herpo the Fowl, who many view as the original Dark Wizard. He not only invented Horcruxes, but also discovered how to breed a basilisk. The ring on Tom Riddle's finger is an heirloom from the Gaunt family, his mother's side of the family. The background on this is that the night he murdered his father, he stole the ring from his uncle Morphin, and later he would turn it into a Horcrux. What Voldemort did not know was that the stone on the ring was actually the Resurrection Stone, one of the three Deathly Hallows, and it had the power to bring people back from the dead, though in a very unliving form. Also, looking at Tom's jacket, the Slytherin logo from back in the day is very different than the present day one, showing that Hogwarts updates the their logos over the years. An interesting detail on the filmmaker's part. Tom saying he wants to split his soul into seven pieces. Can you only split the soul once? For instance, seven. Seven. Ties back to the seven rocks that we saw in his room at the orphanage. He has always been obsessed with the number seven. Also, the reason why he wants number seven is because it is the most magically powered number. And the ring? Belonged to Voldemort's mother. Dumbledore saying that the ring belonged to Voldemort's mother is interesting because it was taken from the gaunt house where she grew up, but it was much more Voldemort's grandfather's and later his uncle's ring than it was his mother's. Dumbledore showing his hand here indicates that the ring was the thing that blackened his hand. This is its own plotline that's very deep and very important to his character. Albus had chased the three Deathly Hallows when he was younger, and it was an obsession. When he realized what the stone on the ring was, he was overcome with excitement and intrigue, so much so that he didn't even think before putting the ring on. It was of course cursed by Voldemort to protect his Horcrux, and Dumbledore was poisoned. Had it not been for Snape, who kept the poison in just his hand, it would have taken over his whole body and killed him right then and there. Instead, Snape gave him about a year to live. When Harry touches the ring, we see some quick shots, which includes Nagini snapping, Voldemort making his very first Horcrux, which I think is one of the coolest shots the movie's ever created, the seven stones in the orphanage, reminding us of that brilliant foreshadowing, a young Tom, the picture of the cave, which is where the next Horcrux is hidden, and present day Voldemort, who actually looks very different than normal, and honestly a little more book accurate with the red around his eyes. You can also hear Tom Riddle screaming during this. <laughs> 
which I believe was him screaming while making his first Horcrux. Harry moving his neck like that after he touched the Horcrux is actually a theme throughout the last movie. He does this every time Voldemort got in his head, and bringing it back for this film was a great addition, especially because he did sort of get Voldemort in his head when touching the ring. Have you ever considered that you ask too much, that you take too much for granted? Has it ever crossed your brilliant mind that I don't want to do this anymore? Whether it has or hasn't is irrelevant. I will not negotiate with you, Severus. Agreed. Snape and Dumbledore's conversation here of course hints at Snape playing the role of a double agent for Dumbledore, which he agreed to do after Lily's death, to protect the boy, aka Harry, at all costs. There are small statues around the astronomy tower, each depicting a baby using a telescope, of course playing into viewing the stars from this tower. This is also the tower where kids take astronomy lessons at Hogwarts. You know, at times, I forget how much you've grown. At times, I still see the small boy from the cupboard. Dumbledore is of course referencing Harry from the first movie, where the Dursleys kept him down in the cupboard under the stairs, and this is a line that wasn't in the book, this was a great line made by the movie. Dumbledore apparating within the grounds of Hogwarts is interesting, because you could never do this in the book, even if you are the headmaster. During this part in the book, Dumbledore and Harry actually flew broomsticks into Hogsmeade to evade those restrictions. The tower to the right of the astronomy tower is actually the headmaster's office, as evidenced by these three little points coming off the side. I point this out because if you look at the headmaster's tower in the other films, the astronomy tower is not there. They actually had to change the floor plan of the castle just for this movie. This shot of Harry and Dumbledore up on this massive rock is taken straight from the chapter art for this novel. This is also the cave pictured in Tom Riddle's room, and it's also the cave where he tormented those kids who were never the same again. Voldemort chose to hide his horcrux here because it was a place of sentiment to him. This was huge for Voldemort, and it's also why he made three of his horcruxes Hogwarts heirlooms, because he had a great sentimental value to the school. Your blood's much more precious than mine. This is a very interesting line, because Harry's blood is actually what saves him in the end. It is very valuable. Voldemort took Harry's blood when making his new body in the Goblet of Fire, and in doing so, Harry's blood inside of the Dark Lord kept Lily's love protection alive, hence why Harry didn't die in the forest during the Battle of Hogwarts. The top of the boat has a skull with a snake coming out of it, which is of course the logo of the Death Eaters, aka the Dark Mark. The stuff that Voldemort makes you drink is called the Emerald Potion or the Drink of Despair. The drink makes you incredibly thirsty, makes you incredibly weak, and most of all, it makes you relive your worst memories. The memory that Dumbledore saw was a specific memory from his past. Grindelwald, the love of his life, starting to duel his brother Aberforth. When Albus intervened, a curse ricocheted and hit Albus' little sister Ariana, which took her life. The film did not convey this very well, but they did have a small line that mentioned this, as Dumbledore said, all my fault. This is my fault. All my fault. Though this isn't really Slytherin's locket, but the fake, I'll give you a history on the locket nonetheless. The locket actually belonged to Voldemort's mother's side of the family, the Gaunts, and it had been passed down for many generations coming straight from Salazar Slytherin himself. When Voldemort's grandfather and uncle went to Azkaban though, it was left to Merope gone, and she sold it to Borgen and Burke. Then fast forwarding a bit, while working at Borgen and Burke years later, Voldemort visited Hepzibah Smith, who I mentioned earlier in the video had purchased the locket from the shop. Voldemort took her life, stole the locket, then turned it into a horcrux and hid it in the cave. Then fast forwarding some more, years later, Regulus Black, Sirius Black's brother, discovered Voldemort's secret, made his way through the defenses of the cave, got the locket, replaced it with the fake one Harry has now, and died in the process. However, he gave the real locket to his family's house elf, Creature, and told him to destroy it, but Creature never figured out how. Then, in comes the trio in the Deathly Hallows. The things coming after Harry are Inferi, and they are dead bodies that are reanimated by dark magic. Voldemort had a whole army of them in his first reign, and he obviously used a ton of them to protect the Horcrux in this cave. As we see Dumbledore's wand, we didn't know it then, but this is actually the Elder Wand, one of the three Deathly Hallows and the most powerful wand in the world. Dumbledore won it after defeating Grindelwald, the former owner of the wand, in what many called the most epic battle of all time. Fire is the only thing that can really stop the Inferi, and honestly, this shot of Dumbledore is so freaking epic and shows off his true power, even when weakened by the Drink of Despair. Malfoy wakes up in the hospital wing and notice not in the Slytherin common room. 
This is because he was still hurt from the Sectum Semper spell, but I'd also guess they just didn't want to make a new set for this one shot. You can see Filch on the border of the castle standing guard, but what the heck is he gonna do? He has no magic, no wand, no weapon, and he's a pretty old dude. In the book, they had Aura stand guard there. The contrast between these kids having a good time at school, cuddling up, making out, and eating wizarding snacks versus Draco who's going on a life or death mission really shows how far removed he has become from the students at Hogwarts that year. In this shot of the Room of Requirement, you can see another chess piece from the first film, and this one is actually the one that Harry said checkmate to. Coming from the cabinet, we have Bellatrix, Greyback, and the Caro siblings, Electo and Amicus. The siblings put masks and hoods on before coming in, because moments before, they did not have these on when entering Borgen and Burke. Draco disarming Dumbledore here is so important, because being the one who disarmed the owner of the Elder Wand, that now makes Draco the owner of the most powerful wand in the world. Weirdly, when Bellatrix, Greyback, back and the Caros arrive at the tower, the Caro siblings no longer have their hoods and masks on, so they put it on just to go through the cabinet and then took it off. Huh. Weird. They also have another person with them, who is Thorfinn Rao, who we saw earlier in the movie, and who I mentioned attacked the trio at the diner in the next book slash movie. Dumbledore saying please to Snape, Severus, please appeared to the others as him saying, please don't kill me. But in reality, this was actually Dumbledore begging Snape to please kill him, knowing that Snape did not want to do this, as referenced earlier in the movie. Has it ever crossed your brilliant mind that I don't want to do this anymore? The dark mark going above the school is the classic Death Eater protocol, as they put it above their dead victims. Though, as I mentioned, it's normally green and not made out of clouds. Also, this differs from the book, because there, they put it up before the death of Dumbledore to use it as a trap to lure Dumbledore to the Astronomy Tower. The spell that Harry tried to use on Snape was a spell that put thick ropes around their body, and we actually saw Umbridge use this on the Centaur in the last film. In this shot of the castle, you can see the clock tower as well as the bridge, and as I've said in past videos in this easter egg series, that bridge was a location made just for the movies. The courtyard they're in when they raise their wands is the same one where much of the second movie took place, though it's in a different location when comparing the layout of the grounds in both films. You can see the window in the Great Hall shattered after Bellatrix blew it up earlier. Also, when looking at the hourglasses for each house, it looks like Gryffindor is in the lead. You can see loads of headmasters in the portraits of Dumbledore's office, all there to help the current headmaster when needed. On Dumbledore's desk, you can also see the Elder Wand, his Half Moon Spectacles, and even a bowl of Sherbet Lemons, one of his favorite candies. That was of course the password to get into his office in the second film. Sherbet Lemon. Seeing that Dumbledore now has a portrait really shows that he's gone, and is now one of the many former headmasters who's there to give the current headmaster advice. And that's exactly what this portrait does for Snape during the Deathly Hallows. Also, Dumbledore had this portrait made months before his death, knowing that no matter what, he would be dead soon, either by the hand of Snape, Draco, or his poisoned hand. Because of this, he ensured that it was made early so that he could speak to it as much as possible, ensuring that the portrait had more of his wisdom and personality, because the more the real person talks to their portrait, the more alike it is to the person depicted. This is why Dumbledore's paintings seem to bring more to the table than the average portrait. R.A.B. is Regulus Octurus Black, Sirius Black's younger brother, who I went over when discussing the history of Slytherin's locket. Fox the Phoenix flying over was him leaving the castle after Dumbledore's death, which also happened in the book, though it happened the night Dumbledore died, not the next day. As the trio looks out to the Great Lake, this is almost the same ending shot as the fourth film, but instead of watching the other schools leave, they watch Fox leave. The credits use an effect that represents the pensive memories and how they move when coming into contact with liquid. And there it is. Every single easter egg in the Half-Blood Prince film. Whew, man that was a lot. Again, if you liked this video, I put a ton of work into it, so please like it for the algorithm. And if you think it's worthy of it, please share it to spread it out some more. That's all I have for you guys today though, but look out for the next part in this easter egg series when I break down Deathly Hallows Part 1. Thank you so much for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. You can follow me on Instagram to see more of my personal life like my cute dog Loki and some behind the scenes movie flame stuff. I also do similar content on TikTok and Twitter that I do here on this channel, so if you like what I do here, check them out. All the handles are right below me and links are in the description. Over here are my wonderful patrons. If you want to be featured on the next video plus get a few other perks, become a patron today. As always, if you liked the video, hit that like button and subscribe and look out for more great movie flame videos on the way.